but I start from yesterday, not further away. I mean, just imagine what an interesting day yesterday must have been for one Nicola Paul Stefan Sarkozy. What do we know about his activities? At 10 a.m. in the morning, he was chairing the government session, the weekly session of the government of the Republic of France. At noon, he was talking to the Minister of Defense of Brazil, one of the greatest emerging economies in the world. At 7.30 in the afternoon or in the evening, depending which part of Europe you're talking about, his wife was giving birth to his and their first child. A little later, he was already in Frankfurt, bidding farewell to the retiring president of the European Central Bank and talking to his colleagues in the Eurozone about the troubles of the Eurozone and the world economy. Now, if I were to scroll through the news this morning, which I did, as I always do, I don't think there is any doubt which of these activities of President Sarkozy yesterday received the widest popular attention. The legend that was sitting here, but no longer is, is a living witness to the fact of what kind of communication really interests people and what is it that they remember of us. It's a pity that no matter how well we try and no matter how many of his kind we would employ, we are not going to be that sexy, that interesting and that popular as the French presidential couple giving birth to their first child ever, because this is not what we are for. Impossible is nothing. That's a very good place to start. So while congratulations are in place for the mother as well as her husband, I somehow doubt that even impossible is nothing. Uh, I'm not sure whether President Sarkozy will be able to spend the next uh, 11 days on paternity leave <laughs> as guaranteed by the law in France. He may have other things in mind. Now, unfortunately, I have not been able to follow these debates in the Eurocom this year uh, uh, for the reasons that our chairman just uh, mentioned. Yet some of my colleagues have been here, and it is from them that I have drawn inspiration for my following very brief remarks. So I'm trying to bring together some of the things that I understand have been said there, project them to the next 12 months, and to draw some lessons that we in the Council and in the European Council and in the General Secretariat that I serve uh, could use in time for our next meeting of the Europcom, things that we could do, things that we have learned from others. My main conclusion is about money. I mean, come on, Euro rules. IP for Europe. That's what the communications is about. But that's the closest you can get to an advertisement ever. And you don't want to visualize that either. Fact of the matter is that we are facing a time when public scrutiny, scrutiny over the way how EU institutions and their officials spend money will be tougher than ever. Next year, we are looking at shrinking economies, increasing unemployment, increasing inequality, uncertainty, suspicion, tensions. Irrespective of what happens next Sunday, these are the tag words for much of the communication and political atmosphere next year. Sound and effective communication is more important than ever. Now is not the time to waste resources, I think, in everyone trying to do the same things or competing with each other. I think now is the time to work together in real partnership. In 2008, only three years ago, less than four years ago, the EU institutions agreed on a deal on partnership in which uh, they decided that broad communication priorities were to be set together. Today, almost four years on, this partnership influences less than 5% of our overall annual investment in communication. Even a 
brief combing through of the part of the Commission's communications activities budget gives you a figure that is more than 100 million. Now, obviously, this is not a simplistic way. I should not be a simplistic way of looking at it. And obviously, I would not even dream of talking about the investment that goes in to the European Parliament. But the fact that we work together effectively in a sense of real partnership and our work together in that real partnership only touches the 5% of the budget makes no sense from the point of view of the times that we are living in. It has to be much, much more and much, much more real. I mean, even in these times of trouble, we have plenty of money. We really do. It's a question how we use it. And all we have to do is invest it well. We have to move away from the silos and work together. And we have to give the word partnership real meaning and content. Learn from each other. Learn from people like Jean-Marie Trou. Draw the connection between priorities and the budget and the audiences that we are trying to influence. Nothing in recent years has challenged us more profoundly than social media. I mean, this past year alone, we have seen a lot of catching up, improvements in the way we use these tools. In the Council, we have focused on our attention on five key areas. And I'm picking those five because they are related to the people from the Council who have been talking here today and yesterday, and on the conclusions and lessons that they have brought to me back from the discussions they've attended. First, you've heard our Director of Communications, Christine Roger, earlier this morning talk about the importance of branding. I mean, let's face it, citizens cannot make a difference between the European institutions, but that is no reason for us not to differentiate between ourselves. And we are what, not one single EU. As long as we pretend that, we will never get anywhere. The job of the Council is different from that of the Commission. One proposes while the other one decides together with the European Parliament, if I may say. Our communication, one way or the other, has to reflect the identity that we have. It cannot be pretending to be anything else. Our identity in the eyes of others is built on what we do. Uh, I had the uh, privilege, uh, thanks to Laurent Thiel, to have dinner uh, the other night with uh, your keynote speaker that may, I've heard many references to. And I sincerely believe, have always believed in what he says. Communication is important, but it pales in comparison to what we do. And it is the moment when the communication departs from the actions of an institution that we are starting to have a problem. When we call black-white, or when we are trying to give a better image of what the things and how the things are. The Communication that reflects our identity is not about how we do it, it's about what we do. The job of the people working in the council secretariat is not to go on the street and talk to people and explain them what is it that happens. Our job is to talk to people like you, to talk to regions, work in partnership with the regions, with the cities, with the municipalities, uh, with the parliament, with the commission, with the member states' governments. Have you heard about the member states' governments? Do you still remember that most, if not all, of our citizens are citizens of a state that is governed by a government that represents a majority of an elected parliament? And the actions that we take in those member states actually could benefit a lot from a cooperation from the governments of those member states, if only they knew what you're planning, because they haven't got a clue. So I'm asking myself, why is it that they haven't got a clue? It comes back to my argument about the 5%. To be clear, in my mind, the real partnership should extend across Europe from the institutions to governments to regional authorities, to local authorities. And it should give rise to some honest soul searching, like the question, who from Brussels can honestly say they are effectively communicating in 27 countries, in 30, 23 languages, to 500 million people? 
when was the last time you saw a communication campaign that effectively, in a proven manner, reached out to all of them? I'd like to see that report. Second, uh, while we've been continuing to catch up with the social media, we have realized that uh, we can't just run forever after others. People talk about the digital divide. Aurelie Valtat has been making the point uh, that uh, we surely do not wish to see the digital divide opening between ourselves as institutions and the people we are communicating with. Uh, we in the Council need to have our own co online or digital strategy, and that's why we recruited uh, Aurelie uh, to work on that. You will hear much more of her in the future. Third, not all new media tools work as well for institutions as they do for individuals. That's another important lesson that we have drawn over the past year. Working closely with the spokesman of the President of the European Council, Dana Manescu, who was speaking here yesterday, has developed a new, almost unique way of using Twitter. I mean, we started only six months or so ago for, with, working with him, and he already now tweets to 24,431 people. Now, the figure in itself, I well understand, it's not unique. How could it be unique? I mean, celebrities are talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of followers. But the analysis of the composition of the followers that we have carried out reveals two interesting facts. First is that the followers of the Herman van Rompuy are actually almost all multipliers. So they are journalists, they are think tanks, they are academia, they are CSO or NGO background people. And secondly, the reason why they follow him is because they think that he is a trusted source of information. So in a way, it runs counter to the essence of social media, and it uses a social media tool because of its brevity and because of the source of the information as a means of confidence building. So if you are interested in what happens with the euro next weekend, if you want to hear the voice of authority from the surrounding noise, uh, come weekend, watch EU HBR. Fourth, it's very easy to get carried away with the phenomenal success of social media. Yet, we should not forget that as the message still continues to rule over form, I hope, so does the relationship between us and the journalists still matter more than the tools that we use. Recently, we in the Council hosted a seminar that looked at the impact of social media in EU journalism, and we were quite surprised of the impact of this seminar. The room was packed. More than 200 people attended. The interest both inside as well as in the social media itself was high. This, too, is a learning process. In the next phase, we will be working with the journalists, with the Association Presse Internationale and others here in Brussels, in order to understand better how we in the Council and the European Council should respond to the changes in their factual working environment. How is it that we can serve them? So before going and, 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 and doing Facebook stuff with them, we have to go to them and ask them, are they able to and how would they like to? Not taking even the best of the social media tools for face value. We can adapt them. We have to adapt them. Otherwise, we are just following everybody all the time. We have also started working on a new mobile tool that will allow all accredited journalists to access and follow decision-making in the Council uh, in a new manner. More of these developments uh, later. Finally, reiterating my point about partnership. We in the institution genuinely sometimes seem to think that the member states and their governments are somehow on the different side of the fence. Um, I heard already in this couple of interventions a lot of talk about how EU should communicate better. Um, it makes me feel a bit aggressive. Uh, I mean, I've been on different sizes of this fence in, as a journalist, as a government official, as a European Commission official, as a European Commission representative, the spokesman of the Commission, working for the EBRD and now for the Council. 
And every which way I turn, I find my always the same argument. Why is not the EU doing better? Now, what is the EU? I mean, why don't we, for one, stop talking about the EU as if it was another planet? Does it make it easier to discuss the issue when we pretend that it hasn't got anything to do with us or our responsibilities or those of the government? Nicolas Sarkozy is a father and a husband, and, but he's also president of the Republic of France. He has a responsibility in this issue that is probably a lot bigger than mine because he takes responsibility for the decisions that the governments are going to take. So I think that we have to work with the member states, use their expertise and knowledge if we ever want to get our message across. People like Hans Brunmeier here, or Neil Sturgesen, who, Neil, Neil Sturgesen, who spoke to you even on that film uh, a little while ago, are important. They are our bridge to the Club de Venice and through the Club de Venice to the governments. That is a real partnership as well. In conclusion, in his farewell speech, uh, President of the European Central Bank, uh, uh, Trichet, he uh, quoted uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe by saying, uh, to know is not enough, to intend is not enough, we must do it. Ours is a world of words, sounds, pictures. We talk, we plan, we dream, we measure, we propose, we talk again, we meet and then we talk. We intend. How many people in the room are using a smartphone? Hands up. How many of you are using an Apple product? I mean, I'm not against Apple when I'm saying stop following the trends. <laughs> Be a trendsetter. <laughs> Do it. Don't follow it. Nicola and Carla Sarkozy did it. President Sarkozy and other European leaders are going to do it. We too, in our own world of communications, we must now move from intentions and talk into doing it. Thank you very much.